Hi there, good morning, or happy whatever time of day it is, wherever you are. I'm Terry Burns, and this video is supplementary material for a class I'm teaching online on the hieroglyphic monad of Dr. John D. using the translation Dr. Nancy Turner and I did that was published by Orboros Press in 2021. If you are not watching uh, that class, the link to it being below, I would let you know at the outset, this is not a beginner's video. This is assuming that you know who John Dee is, that you have a passing acquaintance with the hieroglyphic monad, and that you are interested in knowing how it might relate to Hermetic Kabbalah. Having said that, let me share my screen here and get started. So what I want to do is look at what these sources of Kabbalah would be. Now, as a spoiler here quickly, the most well-known Christian Kabbalistic work that D would have been familiar with, even though it's not in his library catalog, is Reichland's Art of Kabbalah, because no one studying Christian Kabbalah then would have not known that work. And Kabbalah is not, there's not a tree of life pictured because it's in the form of a dialogue. Also, people had a lot greater capacity than to visualize, frankly, than we did now. The whole art of memory is working with different visualizations, as is sacred geometry. That's why it's sacred. You're visualizing perfect forms. All right. Part of this presentation um, I gave last year at the International Medieval Studies Conference. It was also part of the same presentation where I talked about the Kircher tree. I have a link to that below, but the idea that the tree of life used by Hermetic Kabbalists today that is traced back to Athanasius. Kircher is not unique to him, nor do you really want it to be. It, it's the tree used by D, and it, the knowledge is sort of passing through D. The earliest example we get in a Latin text is Paulus Riccio's um, Porta Lucis, or Gates of Light. And I am going to refer to that quite a few times in this presentation. I want to explore these questions. First of all, Okay, we know D in 1562, two years before the hieroglyphic monad, had a lost and unprinted work whose title would translate as Compendious Table of Hebrew Kabbalah. So we're just speculating, what is in it? What would he have known? Something he just did just two years before the hieroglyphic monad is certainly going to influence it. So when did he collect Hebrew grammars? Right around the same time. What sort were they? We're going to look. Was he around other people who might have collected them? What kind of things would they have, have known? And if we knew those approaches to Kabbalah, say in the original Hebrew, would that shed more light on it? Or can we deduce it from the Latinized version? I am assuming that D could not read Hebrew beyond a basic scholarly level. Okay, there's no evidence to suggest that he did. It's, it's possible, but he was mainly interested in reading the Bible and tabling things out. We know his interest in things like gematria. He talks about them in the letter to Maximilian. So would our exploration of these first three questions, would that make us think that these, the way he understood something like Riccio's Latinization of Hecatea's gates of light were different. If that's a mouthful, I'll say what I mean as we get further into this presentation. Luckily for help here, I have this wonderful book by Roberts and Watson called John Dee's Library Catalog. It first came out in 1990. It was last updated or annotations and corrections came out in 2019. Those came all the way from Moscow. Yes, some of these books wound up in Moscow. So this is looking at any book that may have been in Dee's library, not just the ones he listed himself. Oh, and the way books would have wound up in Moscow is because his son Arthur became a physician to the first Russian Tsar, which is a fascinating story, but a bit far afield from what I'm talking about here. All oh, right, they give a facsimile of these 1583 library catalog. It's also available online. You, um, all these links at the bottom of this slide are also below. His 1583 catalog, as you'll see, is very hard to read. But it's also a great resource to have. And if you know Dee's Enochian corpus, this is when he and Kelly are, they're getting ready to go to the European continent and Dee takes along literally hundreds of books with him. But then he lists over weeks, all the books in his catalog. And it's a good thing he does because some of them are missing when he comes back. Perhaps not as many as we're 
as early accounts led people to believe, but some are missing. So that's a great resource. His largest collections, these largest collections are Greek and Latin texts, mainly from early on and works on astrology and astronomy. He's got lots of duplicates, especially works of Paracelsus. What do we mean by lots? Over a hundred, I mean. It, it seems Dee was also teaching people in his home at Mork Lake, and he must have been teaching using Paracelsus. But all of that is later than the time period of the hieroglyphic monad. One of the things that Roberts and Watson also do that's very helpful is they give the biographical background of his book collecting, and they point out that he starts when he's an undergrad at Cambridge, or he's, he starts when he's 15, the first title he has listed he acquired in 1533, and that's when he has a lot of the ancient Greek and Latin texts, not all of them, but many of them. Why? Because that's what he's studying, partly because of that, no doubt, he also annotates them, he writes notes in them. Later on, there's not, not as many notes. Once you get into the 1570s, not as many notes in his book. In 1557, he writes his first list of all the books that he owns. Some of the books that we know that he has, he leaves off. Why? Just consider when we talk about what is going on in Dee's time, or maybe you already know, some books aren't safe to have. And it's not necessarily safe to be a Christian Kabbalist about all you can say is it's safer to be a Christian Kabbalist than a Jewish Kabbalist. From the First Crusade on, there have been at least three genocides of Jews in Europe. In 1492, um, you have, well, the Spanish, the Spanish Inquisition is, is kicking into high gear. First Jews and Muslims in 1492 are expelled from Spain, which is one of the centers of Kabbalistic thought. So keeping our focus just on works of Kabbalah might not be the safest title to have in your library, especially if you're already someone who tends to get in political trouble. And yes, that would be D. He tends to get in political trouble and miraculously survive his whole life. His first trip abroad is 1547. And in his book collecting, there's this unexplained shift from the Greek and Latin classics to book reflecting scientific principles. I'm putting that in quotes because this is the Renaissance idea of, of science. It's not what you would consider science now. Met, the field of medicine, for example, is Greek Galenic medicine or Paracelsian medicine. But a lot of the books that Dee starts to acquire after this are from the scientists that he hung around with in Paris, where he's teaching people. Uh, that included Peter Ramos. It included Guillaume Pastel. Postel, by the way, had a copy of the Sefer Yetzirah. Did D? No. Postel only had it in notes. Would he have shared that with the scholars around him? I would guess yes, but there's no way of, of proving it. Um, from in this time in Paris, and then the later time in the 1560s that I'm getting ready to talk about are the most intellectually exciting times of D's life, if we're to judge by his book collecting. Now, his talking to angels with Kelly in the 1580s might sound more exciting, and maybe it was, but strictly from a collecting books, learning things from the books and scholars you're around, um, the time in Paris and the time in the 1560s are the peak of D as a, a scholar, basically. So quick review, if you need it, of the deadly religious drama going on in Europe, and, and we'll focus actually across the channel in England. You know, I'm sure Henry VIII has broken with the Catholic Church to marry Anne Boleyn. He has gone through a number of wives. Henry VIII is king when Dee is under, under reader of Greek at, um, at Cambridge. Then you get his only legitimate son, who is also a Protestant. That's Edward. Um, Edward dies. And there is the nine-day queen, Jane, who is executed after that. And then you get... Um, Mary, Henry VIII's first daughter. She marries the King of Spain. England becomes Catholic again. There's all kinds of executions and horrible things going on. That's why she's sometimes called Bloody Mary. Then after Mary, you get Queen Elizabeth, who changes the country back to Anglicanism. So 
just as an example, Dee winds up in the Tower of London in 1555. That's just a week after then Princess Elizabeth winds up in the Tower. Um, there is some discussion based on misreadings of the monad that Dee was sure that the Earth was the center of of the solar system. We know in this time period he hung around Copernicans. One reason we know is that one of them, John Field, that he was thrown in the tower with, was there in the tower with D. Gee, would they have talked about Copernicus? Maybe in whispers. The point is, there are many things that one can easily deduce that D knew about that it isn't really safe for him to have in his library. Um, by the way, Dee was in the tower because he drew up a birth chart, not just for Princess Elizabeth, but also for Queen Mary. Um, so back to his library. It's interesting, given his religious convictions, um, he was a married priest, by the way, before he converted to Protestantism. For more on that, uh, look at Glenn Perry's Arch Conjure of England. But he didn't have any Bibles that were in English. He had, when he's writing out Bible verses, in English, it's usually he's doing his own uh, kind of spontaneous translation from the Latin Vulgate. He has grammars for lots of languages, not just Hebrew. In fact, he has no apparent interest in Hebrew or Kabbalah that you can tell from his library catalog with the understanding that it might not have been the safest thing to list, but he has no apparent interest until 1560. For the next decade, we know mainly where he is by the books he collects and what he writes in them. He's going to go as far south as Venice. He's going to go all around Italy. He's going to go through Germany and Hungary. He's going to cross the Alps twice. And of course, he's in France and Belgium. All right. With my slide will progress here. We will look at, yes, here we go. His 1583 library catalog. By 1583, he's going to have a whole section that he lists as Hebrew, Chaldean, and Syriac works that are mainly Hebrew works, although there's a couple that purport to be Chaldean grammar and so on. You can link that to things like the, the Voar Chadamas, but I won't do that right now. He has a this whole subsection, and these are the number volume numbers, not years. So this isn't the year 1564, it's book number 1564. So book numbers 1558 through 16. 24 are all in this section. By 1561, Dee is traveling on the continent collecting Hebrew grammars. As Robert and Watson say, the relatively large number of survivors among these books may lead us to exaggerate this trend, but it's confirmed by Dee's own dating in 1562 of his lost and unpublished compendious table of Hebrew Kabbalah. Now, I mentioned Reuchlin's Art of Kabbalah. Note that there is one of Reuchlin's books. Let me find it. There it is. His Hebrew lexicon is there. That is also something that Riccio advised on, by the way. But there's another book of Reuchlin's that we talked about in Theorem 10. That is the Verbo Mirafico. That isn't even listed in this section. That's the one where he comes up with the pentagrammaton. All right. That's in another section before this. Also, Riccio, the person who translates Gikatiya's work, he has a title listed earlier. So D is clearly aware of the works of Riccio. He just doesn't have the Gates of Light listed here any more than he has the Art of Kabbalah listed here. Um, Roberts and Watson will list out all of the books that they think have to do with Hebrew studies. But again, Riccio is not Riccio's book isn't on here. Reuchlin's Verbo Mirafico isn't. Roberts and Watson were, did an incredible, incredible service, but deciphering what people wrote 400 years ago is hard work, much less knowing what every single one of those works are. So they missed a few. All right, they didn't know that Verbo Mirafico had to do with Christian Kabbalah. Well, you can't blame them. They did a lot of, came up with a lot of other things. Um, one of the things they don't attempt to do is translate every word of all of the titles. They number them and try to figure out what they were about. So to give an example of this first one up here, that uh, book, this is book number 1585, not the year 1585. 
we would assume since this is about spheres of the world and the Sephiroth, which are emanations of God or sometimes in Christian Kabbalah portrayed as spheres of God, we would assume that's a Kabbalistic work. Um, Hebrew with Latin. Um, we're going to get um, uh, things about the Bible. Let's see, it's 1590. Many, many things. Um, Greek, Latin, um, and Hebrew. We're going to find out he's very interested in predictions. Here's John the prophet in Hebrew with Latin. So you can say that's Dee's interest, which is very true given his apocalyptic focus through much of his life. These are also safe things to have. We're just studying the Bible, right? So his grammars are mainly ways of studying the Hebrew Bible and the Kabbalah derived from it, but the Kabbalah derived from it part is less safe and less obvious. So let me give you a little bit of a timeline because this is the most fruitful time period of Dee's life as a writer of something other than revealed angelic language like the Enochian corpus. Understanding that's what most people are interested in with Dee now, but Let's look at the things he's writing in this incredibly fruitful time period. Before this, he had his lost aphorisms to the Parisians. He refers to those several times in the letter to Maximilian, even talks about what he says in some of them. Um, one might suspect that he just kept revising them because in 1558, you get his Propoitomata Aphoristica. Sometimes it's called a guide to navigation, but it's basically his fundamental foundational ideas of teaching that he thinks everyone should know. The version that comes out in 1558, this is before he's collecting Hebrew grammars and it has no Hebrew in it, surprise. He sends this to map maker Gerardus Mercator. That's the person who does the Mercator projection, perhaps still today, the most famous map maker in Western European history. Later that year, Queen Mary, the one whose henchman had him thrown in the tower, she dies, his life improves. He has a, a very friendly relationship with Elizabeth I who is coronated and she's coronated on the date that Dee suggests astrologically. By 1561, Dee is off. He's on the continent collecting books and hanging out with scholars. Um, and who knows what else he's doing? Is he doing intelligence work? Who knows? He's doing intelligence work in the specific Renaissance idea of intelligence, of learning about everything and using it to further your government. So he visits many people. Let me use uh, Conrad Gessner, who's a famous Swiss physician, Paracelsian physician, mathematician, natural scientist. The only reason that we even know he got to Zurich where Gessner was is because there was this idea of keeping albums where whenever your educated uh, humanist visitors come in or some famous political person, you have them sign the album and there's Dee's signature. That is, Dee doesn't leave a travel log. So the way that we piece all the places he was is mainly from his books and a few things like the signature album. So he crosses the Alps. He actually crosses the Alps twice in this time. He travels around Italy. He meets people like Federico Comandino in Urbino. He goes to Padua, which is later the home of Galileo. He buys books in Venice. Oh, the seat of Christian Kabbalah. And not only does, is that the seat of Christian Kabbalah, this is also, well, and he goes to Florence. He's copying some things down that we know never wind up in any catalog. The Codex Marcianus that is so important in his later Enochian work is one of the big titles, but you know there are others. And that's why additions to this library catalog showed up as late as 2019, because some other book that used to belong to John Dee is found somewhere, Connecticut, Moscow, all over the place. He writes his compendious table of Hebrew Kabbalah in 1562, right after this flurry of collecting Hebrew grammars. Now, what does that tell you? Unless you want to make an argument, which I don't want to make, that Dee was somehow really fluent in Hebrew and could just sit down with the Hebrew Bible and read it, no problem. 
I don't think that's likely. Anything's possible, but I think that's highly unlikely. So unless you make that argument, then what you're looking at is that he is tabling out Hebrew to help learn Hebrew to do the kind of things he says he's interested in in the letter to Maximilian, like Gematria, Noterikon, Timura, three terms that, by the way, are in Reichland's Art of Kabbalah. He is tabling out Kabbalistic associations, in other words. And I'm going to give you examples of that and, and what I think the things are that would likely be there in a moment. By 1563, according again to his letter to Maximilian, he's at Maximilian's coronation in Bratislava. Um, I've already mentioned about uh, Reuchlin's books, uh, Virbo Mirafico, not even being listed in the Hebrew section and Risio's not being listed there. 1564 is when he writes the Monus Hieroglyphica. Coming right at the end of this intense period of time, it would, think, it would seem that it's gonna partly reflect his ideas on Kabbalah, whatever they are. Um, he's back in England in, at least by 1566. He might've got married the year before. That would be his second wife, not Jane D. Um, by 1568, when a new edition of the Propoidomata Aphoristica comes out, all of a sudden there's Hebrew in it, including aphorisms that no one has understands. So he wasn't shy in applying his Hebrew. But let me just read you some things that Roberts and Watson say. Compared with the evidence about the Paracelsian books, as there being so many copies of them, the evidence about D's Hebrew, Chaldean, and Syriac books is of a better quality, but at the end it tells us less about the owner. The books survive in a relatively large number. Dee's concession to Hebrew practice in writing his name backwards with exquisite skill is the only evidence we have encountered that he had any sense of humor. Well, that's not a very nice thing to say, Roberts and Watson. What they mean, of course, is that Dee, when he writes his name backwards, it's backwards using our alphabet. Hebrew goes the other direction as English and Latin and Greek. Unless it suggests that he had none at all, why? Well, because he should write his name backwards in Hebrew. It's not funny. Okay, we'll discuss, they say, the salient features of his Hebrew collection. And it's sufficient that to point out that he seemed in the first place to have relied for his introduction to Kabbalah upon Latin interpretations in the work of Lull. There's a lot of books by Raymond Lull, who's also an alchemist, Pico della Mirandola who is probably poisoned because of his interest in Christian Kabbalah. Uh, Heinrich Cornelia Agrippa, who has famously tabled out Hebrew Kabbalah and his work is in Dee's library. Reuchlin, who I've already mentioned and Francesco Giorgi. So if we don't argue the point, and I have no interest in arguing with them on this point, that Dee comes to Hebrew through Latin. He does, he's not just buying books in Hebrew and reading them. He's looking at Latin versions of understanding Hebrew, much in the same way if you're an English speaker and wanna learn Spanish and you get a Spanish textbook, it tells you in English how to learn Spanish. We might say that's not as good as immersion, but it'd be kind of dangerous for him to immerse himself in a Jewish community to learn Hebrew, to state the obvious. Dangerous for that community even more so. so the imprint dates begin with a cluster in the 1520s, that, and they continue steadily into the mid-1560s, which is when he is gathering them. They say, it, it seems fair to conclude that his Hebrew studies bore little fruit beyond facilitating his practice of Kabbalah, and that he abandoned them in the late 1560s. Well, I'm going to wind up agreeing with that by the way, and speculate about why. But first, if he relied upon these Latinized translations, what can we infer about his Kabbalistic work? What is he tabling out? Well, I have argued in that video below on the Kircher tree that Dee was probably familiar with this Porti Lucis, Paolo Riccio's 1516 source, uh, or one of the sources of Reuchlin's 1517 art of Kabbalah. And I've pointed out that this isn't exactly the hermetic tree we use, right? It doesn't have these two side paths and it doesn't have the transverse line. It does have kind of an intersection here where we would consider dot. That gets to be very important in the 11th theorem of the hieroglyphic monad. But here's an interesting thing. This is Riccio translating into Latin. 
over here is a recent translation into English directly from Hebrew. And they're going to have the cross paths. They still don't have the side paths, which makes sense because if you look at the first 10 theorems and how D is showing the tree to be created, you don't have these side paths. All right. What would we mean by a table of Kabbalah? Well, if you're familiar with the work of Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa, and if you're not, you should be if you're studying this time period, you know that it's full of magical correspondences, including Hebrew correspondences. Here is uh, the one that were the James Freak translation that Donald Tyson put out and now has generously just put online for free at the Internet Archive. You'll uh, have a chapter in Agrippa of divine names or power and virtues, and he's writing out Hebrew names, dividing them up. Names that answer to Saturn, intelligence of Saturn, what's up? The associations you make in Hebrew Kabbalah of elements to particular Sephiroth and planets to particular Sephiroth exists in Hebrew Kabbalah. That's not something like um, the conflation with Pythagoreanism that D is doing that is only in Christian Kabbalah or the pentagrammaton that's only in Christian Kabbalah. It's, it's just part of Kabbalah. Okay, so if you were tabling things out before you're gonna do things like the things in Agrippa, and by the way, there's a subtext here. Well, the first thing you might do is you might write out the letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And what is it in English? And then what number corresponds? Because Aleph directly means one, or Bet directly means two. What uh, meaning would other meanings would that have? You might table things out that way. You might notice some things about the Hebrew Aleph Bet that there's mothers and doubles and simples. And these might seem numerically significant in the same way we find the same significance in the hieroglyphic monad. Like there's three, oh, a ternary, doubles, there's seven. Remember all these bit about three times seven? And then there's 12. In theorem 12, when time begins, we're gonna get all of the, you know, the zodiac, 12 months, so on. You might even learn how to write out the names of the Sephiroth. Yes, I am, for those of you in Kabbalistically based initiatory societies, I'm shamely stealing from the 1937 knowledge lectures published by Israel Regardi, has written out by my husband, John Moore, who for many, many years served as hierophant of such a temple. In other words, these compendious table of Kabbalah likely at least begins as beginner Kabbalah of the same type that initiations are structured around in Kabbalistically based initiatory societies, and then grows into this type of thing that you have with Athanasius Kircher. So what if D wasn't just tabling this out at a beginner's level, but had people to talk to who were doing the same thing. Well, given that his travel itinerary is basically visit this scholar, visit that library, and we know that he, where he is by what he collects. Let's see how this Gates of Light would be different if we looked at an English translation. Now, by the way, I want to tell you why I was doing this. It is simply looking at theorem 11, which seems to perfectly fit to the concept of dot, which would emanate from here. But that word itself doesn't exist in the Latin translation. It is inferred, but it isn't mentioned, OK? I didn't in that class refer to this English translation simply because I don't know Hebrew myself beyond the basic kind of tabling out Kabbalah. That is, I can't speak it. And there have been critics who have said that this particular translation has problems. I don't know enough Hebrew to know really. Someone who knows more than I will will have to discuss this. Um, but if theorem 11 appears to refer to dot, D shouldn't know about that because it's not, as I said, in the Latinized 
gates of light in an obvious way. It's inferred. And D and educated people in D's time are very good at teasing out correspondences and picturing things. Part of the idea with Kabbalah, like with sacred geometry, is you're supposed to picture it and contemplate on it. Um, it's a, a revelatory, a revealed tradition. These are powers of God. It's the precursor to these angel magic. In fact, it is angel magic because there are angels and choirs of angels and archangels that are part of what you associate with each sephira. So during the time that Dee wrote his lost work of Kabbalah, he's collecting in the heart of Christian Kabbalism. And during that time period, we know he collected or copied works that he never recorded, the Codex Marcianus being my favorite example. So Gikatiya's original, Gikatiya being a student of Abraham Abu Lefia in Spain, who wrote this book, translated as Gates of Light, his original refers to dot. Let's see, when we are talking about that, we're told, know that the three spheres drawn from Kether, from the edge of the letter Yud, are mentioned in their Hokma, Bina, and Dot. The essence of Dot is the middle line, what we now would call the middle pillar, which is the letter Bob because it bears two arms, and so on. With Dot, the interiors of the earth were split open. So this matches perfectly these puncturing and creation being born spilling down the middle pillar basically and creating the world. The middle line stands between right and left, the right pillar and the left pillar. And it's the one that splits between them, arbitrates between them and reconciles the two. This is the rule. Whenever you find the word dot, it is the third and it arbitrates between the other two. That sounds like the receptacle in Plato's Timaeus. So the concept of dot in the Porte Lucis fits so perfectly that at a certain point, all I can tell you is, well, it fits perfectly. Don't know if he could have known about it or not, but it seems more satisfactory to assume that D did have that idea than he suddenly came up with it, unless you are, you know, in the angelic revelation, then have it that way. Other works in D's library refer to dot, but they don't picture it on the tree. I've already talked about the notion though of, first of all, if you picture Kabbalah, it's clear, what are you doing? You're doing Jewish mysticism and you, you know, even though there are people doing Christian Kabbalah, the term itself isn't even coined until Heinrich Kuhnrath at the end of the century D is, is writing and, and Kuhnrath is worried about persecution also for his ideas of alchemy, but now, in Theorem 12, I'll talk about the influence of prophetic works in long world ages, and the big name with that is Joachim of Fiore. But he only has a couple of books of Fiore in his, in his library, and yet he knows that apocalyptic influence really well. He uses it not only in Theorem 12, but several after that. So D has actually many more books on Hebrew than he does on, say, the prophecies of Joaquin de Fiore. So in my opinion, D had a conception of dot, but you need to make up your own mind there. Now, another question that this sort of begs, and we can only speculate about this, but let's speculate. It's kind of fun. Why does D stop collecting Kabbalistic works after the 1560s? I mean, does he just, he maybe, he has it committed to memory and doesn't want to risk anything, so he he gets uh, rid of them or let's see, he and he and Kelly go to Prague where Rabbi Lowe is and that supersedes everything because we know in his diaries, somebody, probably Kelly is visiting the Jewish quarter. Ah, let's go for something a bit more prosaic. How about he's written his best works by that time. And by the time that his second Propoidomata aphoristica, the one with Hebrew comes out, it's like, he, he has written kind of the pinnacle of these theorems and aphorisms that he has spent a decade of his life diving into. And in the same period that he wrote his compendious table of Hebrew Kabbalah. By the 1580s, he's decided that men have nothing left to teach him. And that's why he is wanting to talk to the angels. That's why he wants a scryer and keeps going through scryers until he winds up with Kelly so that someone can help him learn the language, the Adamic first language of God. Hebrew isn't old enough for him by then. Also on a mundane level, after the 1560s, 
um, he's going to get married for the third time. Pretty soon he's going to have a house full of kids and maybe that would keep him busy. He's, he's 50 years old when they start his continental adventure and speaking as someone in their 50s, I have a heck of a lot less energy now than I did when I was in my 20s and 30s traveling all over the place. So, but perhaps Hebrew isn't close enough to the original Adamic language that he is searching for. By the 1580s, his adventures with Angelical, also called Enochian, begin. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where this video will end. What I want you to see is that Dee had lots of sources of Hebrew grammar. I am certain he had a at least superficial understanding of Kabbalah using the same tree used as Hermetic Kabbalists today, except without those two side paths, the one of which goes from Netzach to Malkuth and the other from Hod to Malkuth. Okay, that's all I've got for you today. Bye-bye.